Okay. I would love for you, if you have an opportunity to go ahead and take the poll that we have here this morning, you should see that pop up on your screen. Also in the chat box, let us know where you're joining from. We'd love to know that as well. Um, there should be a little dialogue bubble at the bottom um, of your screen so you could open that up as well. And we are at the top of the hour. So I say, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, thank you for taking that poll. Um, we appreciate that so much. Um, we just like to thank you all again for being here today. We'd also like to thank our wonderful funder, the Department of the Air Force School Liaison Program for making today's webinar on understanding impact when a parent leaves the military possible. Again, thanks for taking that poll. I see we're kind of split 50-50 between parent and counselor, so we appreciate that. Um, if you'd like to X out of that poll, it's either in the upper left-hand corner or right-hand corner, there should be a little red X, and so you can close that. Um, it's nice to always know who's attending our webinars, um, and we thank you again for being here. We do always welcome professionals who work with and support our military connected children to our parent um, trainings, and um, we think you'll find the information and tips we present useful, but please note that our parent support webinars have been designed with parents as the target audience, so we always like um, like you to know that. Um, again, please feel free to share where you're joining us from in the chat box. We'd love to know that as well. And if you are joining by phone, um, we will have a downloadable resource that we'll put in the chat box. Um, you may not be able to probably access that, so we can always email that to you. So you can email that to us as well. Um, thanks, Stacey. It looks like you're from Boston. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. So let's uh, tell you a little bit about who we are. We are the Military Child Education Coalition. We are a nonprofit organization that was established more than 20 years ago. Actually, this year is our 25th anniversary. Um, and so we are excited to um, join for to kind of celebrate our anniversary this year at our global training summit that we have in DC. Um, if you are not able to hear us, you might have to kind of, might have to go out and come back in. So that sometimes that helps with the audio um, if you're not able to hear us. Um, okay, so our mission here at MSEC is to support all military connected children in regards to their education, um, advocacy, and also just collaborating to resolve a lot of those education challenges that are associated with the military lifestyle. In 2005, MSEC formalized support and programming for our military connected parents so that they may be empowered, informed, and proactive in supporting their children's educational journey. We strive to deliver these informative and interactive webinars that address those academic and social and emotional issues, again, that come with that military family lifestyle. Our vision is that we would love for every military connected child to be college, work, and life ready. That's very important to us here at MSEC. A little bit about me. Again, my name is Nikki Harrison. I have been with MSEC since 2018. So actually this year I'm coming up on my fifth anniversary. I was an active duty military spouse for almost 20 years. Now I'm a veteran spouse to a retired Marine, and we are parents to two boys. I have a rising senior. I'm already getting class of 2024 communication, so I am a little teary-eyed about that. Um, and then we also have a seventh grader. And because I always forget to say, I reside in El Paso, Texas. Um, I always forget that. I didn't this time. And I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, my colleague, so she can introduce herself. Thank you, Nikki. I reside in Madison, Alabama, which is just outside of Huntsville. Um, so that's where I'm joining you from today. And it is lovely today, just beautiful. Um, I grew up and lived in near Hershey, Pennsylvania my entire life, another kind of famous town known for its chocolate. Uh, my husband also has left the military. He retired in 2015 after 30 years of active duty Army service. We moved over 14 times um, 
and lived as far away as Alaska and Germany and have raised two um, military connected children that are actually in college. We had them a little later in life. <laughs> they are in college. Um, and I've been working with m since 2017. So we're both been here for a little while. So let's talk about a little bit of admin before we get into our webinar. At the end of the webinar, we would like to invite you and encourage you to take our survey about today's presentation. We really would appreciate if you take the few minutes uh, it would require for you to give us your feedback. It is a key method that we use to tell our funders what we're doing. And it also lets us know what well, we need to tweak things so we can continue offering you know, the best training available for you, our military connected parents and military connected professionals. As Nikki said, you'll see a chat box on your screen. And when we will ask you questions during the webinar, please, please utilize the chat box to to respond. As always, we encourage you um, to, um, to do that. We also ask that you have a piece of paper and a pencil available for today. We will be doing a quick activity and you'll want to have that available. Please know that you can always re record or view the recording at a later date if you want to review the material or maybe you'll experience some technical difficulties. Hopefully your audio is working better now. Um, but during the presentation, so it is being recorded. Okay, let's take a look at what we're going to be look, learning today. At the, by the end of the webinar, our parents and caregivers and professionals should be able to describe the social, emotional, and educational impacts of a transition out of the military. They should better know how to prepare the family for the transition and explore best practices, strategies, and resources to help with this transition from the military to the civilian world. And, and as I said, we've both been through it, Nikki and I, so we can totally relate to all of these and maybe some of you as well. So the military to civilian transition is the process experienced by military personnel as they leave the service and then return to that civilian life. The MCT process is thought to be challenging across a range of key areas, but like such employment, healthcare, and community integration. It can be a very exciting time, you know, a new job, maybe a new location, but it can also be very complex and very stressful. Maybe you don't want to go to that new location. Maybe you're not crazy about your new job, <laughs> you know, who knows? So, we all know that it not only affects the service member, but the entire family. There's some common challenges that the service members and their family experience when they leave the military. So let's just touch base on some of these. Sometimes it's difficult relating to the people who don't understand what military personnel have experienced. And many civilians, you know, they don't know what they don't know, right? Reconnecting with the family and reestablishing a role in that family can be difficult. What if you have never, during your time in the military, you've moved away from your extended family and now you're moving back? So how do you fit in that, those dynamics? Um, you have to join that new community, create that new community that you just left. Um, you need to prepare to enter the civilian world and all that that entails. So I know, remember my husband having to buy new clothes, <laughs> you know, you told what to wear for how many years and now what, you know, what kind of clothes do I need for my, what's appropriate, what goes, what goes with what. And then you look to create those new routines because it's no longer getting up and going to PT in the morning and then going or how, you know, whatever your new old routine was, now you're going to have that new one. And then adjusting to providing those necessities, the financial things like food, housing, clothing, no more BAH, that basic allowance for housing, that's, that's gone. Um, adjusting to a possible different pace of life and of work, most likely, you know, I would say my husband has a shorter day, but um, a much faster pace than what he did in the military. But, uh, you know, everybody's different. But once the civilian culture, um, what tended to be, what tends to be more an individualistic workplace culture, where, as you know, the military is more of a culture of service and teamwork. So it's kind of a different mindset as when you enter, exit the military. 
So let's look at some of the, this is that little activity that we're gonna to discuss to talk about the impact that a transition can bring to a family. So take out, I'm just using an index card. So a piece of paper or an index card with something and, and a writing instrument. I have a pen here, so you don't need too much room. But first, number one, first think about your daily routine, your weekly routine, and the way that you, maybe the way you drive home at night, um, a special place that you like to eat lunch, or maybe a group that you get together with for coffee. And that's something that you do now that's on a regular basis. So something doesn't have to be daily, weekly, you know, doesn't have to be every day. Then I want you number two, I want you to think about people other than, you know, your family, immediate family that you have established a relationship with and that you rely on. Um, I think for maybe for women, somebody who cuts your hair, that could be important for men too, but typically more so for women. Uh, or you have a, a great babysitter that, you know, you rely on. Um, yeah, other people maybe in your life that you're just so glad that they're there. And number three, Think of a group that you're connected with, either formally or informally. Perhaps you're in a book club or a religious affiliated class, or you eat lunch every day with the same people at work. Write down the name of that group or you know, whatever you want to call it on a piece of paper. Write down that group connection. I'll give you just a couple more minutes here. Um, so, so number one, at your daily routine. Number two, people that you've established a relationship with that you really count on. And number three is just someone who you're connected with and you, you hang out with. So I want you to take, when you're finished, and sign your name at the bottom of that paper. And I want you to fold it carefully. And then I want you to tear it out and throw it over your shoulder. <laughs> So we have a question for you. Give us a couple words in the chat box of how you feel right now after we ask you to do that. And then we just tore it up in little pieces. Maybe one word, could be two words, could be a couple more. I know the first time that I did this, I was asked to do this. I was a little frustrated, anxious. Yes, that's a good one. Um, I was really kind of upset because I felt like um, sad. Yeah, you took all that time, right? You took all that time to do the activity. You really thought about it because, you know, you thought, well, I might be asked to share this information, so it has to be good. And then we just tossed it away. So we didn't validate. <laughs> it didn't validate you. So some of the answers that we got today, we got anxious and sad. Um, other examples have been uneasy shocked you know what pretty why did you tell me to do that lost that's a good one um you know you just that your feelings didn't didn't matter so why did we do this this little activity gives us a glimpse of what our military connected children are feeling every time they have to move and actually the adults as well i can i can vouch for that and for those of you that are or have been in the military you understand this feeling only too well Everything changes, routines change. Although we should attempt to keep as many of those as possible, and we'll talk about that. Um, you have to say goodbye to friends. That local support system that you have built up is dismantled. Um, and you know that you have to build those new relationships again at a new location. So another feeling might be tired because you're like, oh, I have to do it all over again. Make a new piece of paper with all new names. Now we're going to show you a video um, about supporting veterans' children through transition. While most people tend to hmm. think of... Um, can you hear that? You can. Okay. Hmm, separation thank you. ...from the military as a result of retirement or expiration time of service or ETS... There are a number of other factors that play a role in the separation of military service. These include a reduction in force, 
life-altering injuries or disciplinary reasons. Unfortunately, these separations are often unexpected and can leave families financially strapped and emotionally disheartened. It's not just the military service member that experiences the challenges. The entire family experiences the outcomes of separation. These include, number one, relocation. While military families relocate seven to nine times during a parent's service, a big challenge is relocating to a non-military community. Customs, traditions, support groups, and other familiar elements will change and that can affect our ability to learn and thrive. We have been a military family for our entire life and within a few days, our reality has changed. Number two, possible financial challenges for our parents. Whether this comes from unemployment or other reasons, the unknown is scary. And number three, family issues. It's not just our parents leaving the military, it's all of us. Sometimes the element of change alone can be enough to cause some tension for us as we settle into our new life. So one of the things that I think about when I watch this is that Nikki and I were lucky in that our husbands retired. So they were looking ahead. They, they put that paperwork in, in what, a year in advance, right? So they knew when they were going to retire. But sometimes this transition out of the military can be very unexpected. So there's additional challenges that come with those type of transitions. And the, again, the entire family is, connect, is uh, affected. I'm going to transfer it back to Nikki to talk about the transition cycle. Okay, thanks, Michelle. So we are, um, actually, we have another poll that we're going to have up for you. Um, what stage are you in with moving out of the military? So we'd love for you to take a few minutes to answer that. Are you exploring the idea? Are you transitioning out but haven't started the process? Uh, maybe you're in the midst of transitioning or just left the military. So if you could take a few minutes and just answer that, that'd be great. Um, it looks like someone's just left the military. So someone's just recently um, separated. Um, so yeah, if you have a moment to take that. Okay, transitioning out, but haven't started the process yet. So sounds like you're kind of in, in the middle of, of kind of figuring all of those things out. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much for taking that poll. We really appreciate that. Again, you can close that out with that little red X. Um, I'm so curious, for, Nikki, the person who just got out, how long have they been out? Yes, if you'd like to share. If yeah, you if you'd like to share. Yeah, recently left the military, please feel free to share with us in the chat box. That's something good to know. Uh, my husband just transitioned or, or retired last year. So we are actually one year this month. Well, technically July is when our year is official, um, but it hasn't been too long. So we'd love for you to share. Regardless of which stage you're in though, leaving the military can be challenging, not only for the service member, but we know also for the family. Um, okay, so we see someone's um, spouse retired in 2018. So not too long ago. So you're, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, being in the military though is more than a job. It's a lifestyle that affects everybody in the family and it's going to take some time to adjust. So what you see on the screen is our transition cycle. And we're gonna go through those different phases of that cycle. We know that children and adults are going to experience um, these some of these phases during um, their transition. Not everyone's going to go through the, each one of the phases or stages. It's a very individualized experience. So we, we wanna let you know, I know that I'll tell you that I probably spend a lot more on the left side of the curve than I have on the right side of the curve. Um, so that first stage though is denial. This is you saying it's not happening. You're not going to think about it. You probably don't really wanna talk about it with anybody. Um, you just are in complete denial of the transition. That next stage or phase is resistance. This is where 
um, okay, so it's happening, but you're, you're not really going to acknowledge it. You want to stay where you're at. You want to keep your core group of friends um, or your tribe. I've, I've read that recently is being a, another term. Um, maybe your kids really love their school and they love their teachers and their neighborhood and their activities. And so they just want to stay where they're at. Um, and you're really resistant to that. Um, maybe you've, you're kind of transitioned and you're still resistant in that new location because you don't want to do anything, right? You don't want to go find friends. You don't want to find activities. You're not going to join any clubs or organizations. So you're very resistant, um, even maybe after that transition has happened. That next stage is exploration. This is the stage where children and adults realize that the, the transition is inevitable and that you might as well make the best of it and kind of explore all of your different options. Um, your children are gonna develop and grow through acceptance and create a new expectations in this phase. And this is how they're going to build those resiliency skills that we talk about that are so important. And then that last stage is commitment. This is where you fully become part of the community and or school. You've you know, found your, your people, so to speak. You've joined um, those clubs or organizations or found your, your core activities. Uh, maybe it's volunteering, maybe it's a job for, you know, for an adult, it could be you found a new job in that new location. And so that's making you feel really good. So some key points to kind of remember is that children and youth in the denial and or resistance stage are distracted from pursuing academic success. So they are focused really on those social aspects of their lives. And it's really hard for them to focus on the academics or the educational piece. But we know that personal and academic growth happens when they move into those exploration and commitment phases of the transition cycle. And so something to kind of keep in mind here is you see that it's the cycle is pretty equal between all four quadrants. Um, our little curve um, is right in the middle. So next we're going to talk about what that transition cycle looks like when we're showing resilience. Um, that's going to be really important and pay attention to the curve uh, now a little bit. So the transition cycle of a child who is a resilient um, that means they're going to adapt to change more easily. They'll spend a few moments or days in denial and resistance and then move on to exploration. So you'll see how they've spent kind of that curve has shifted a little bit to the left. So it's, you know, they've spent a really sh short period of time in the denial and resistance phase. They're able to move through those really quickly and go right into exploration and commitment. Um, the question is why? How do they do that? Well, they know that it's going to be okay. Uh, they may feel competent and confident about handling new situations, which are some of those resiliency skills that we've talked about. They have connections with their family and community. So one of the things that's really important for our children is when you move to that new location or you're in that new area, um, you know, making those connections as quickly as possible for them is really important. Maybe they've had success in transitioning and dealing with state, uh, with changes in the past. So they're really familiar with the process and they kind of know what's going to happen. They've learned that their own attitude and actions determine if that new situation is going to be a positive experience or if it's going to be a negative experience. And maybe they've had the realization that they have some control over what kind of experience they're going to have. So we know that resiliency is a skill set that can be learned. And Dr. Ken Ginsberg, who is a longstanding member of MSEC Science Advisory Board, emphasizes that factors promoting resilience in military children include those positive and nurturing relationships with parents and other trusted adults in their life the ability to regulate their emotions. So we know self-regulation is huge and having some self-esteem. And that kind of goes with those, we talked about confidence and competence kind of going hand in hand that helps build that self-esteem. 
So Michelle's put a link in the chat to fostering resilience. And so you can go to that and there's a lot more additional um, information on resiliency there. So let's talk a little bit about those social and emotional impacts. So MSEC did a military kids um, ed study in November of 2020. And it talks about how transition impacts children. And so the survey was, I think we had over 4,000 that were polled. And so it was, it's a really great study actually. We'll put that link in the chat. And so you can kind of walk through and see all of the things that were asked. But what we're going to highlight are some of those common challenges that the children that took the study um, kind of said. Uh, that meeting new friends is can be really challenging, really difficult. They may experience loneliness. They're missing their old friends. They're missing their own community. We know that mental health challenges arise, especially in our teens. We've noticed that over the past few years, our teens are really battling some mental health challenges. There's a challenge with adjustment to a new place, a school, a culture. Um, I always talk about we've had the opportunity as, well, as Michelle has to live all over the country as well as overseas. Um, we lived in Japan. The culture in Japan is going to be completely different than when we lived in California, um, the culture that we experienced in California. So kids are getting used to that as well. There's sadness, anger, and even apprehension or that fear of unknown that can happen as well. So we know each child is unique um, and a move from active duty to the civilian life brings a particular set of opportunities, challenges, and of course we, we know that there's some unknowns. But a parent's willingness to um, kind of accept that leaving the military um, does not always ensure that the child is going to have that same willingness. Having to move off installation, I think this is something that we really um, are starting to highlight more. You may be staying in that same community, but you're no longer going to live on the military installation um, in housing. Now you have to move off of that and you have to live in the civilian community that can be really challenging if you've had a child that's always been used to, to living on a base or a post or something like that. And a change in family dynamics can also mean that students have that less opportunity to engage in activities and peer groups. Um, so that can be a challenge as well. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Michelle and she's gonna talk about that loss of identity. Thank you, Nikki. So in addition to all the impacts that we've already just described, perhaps the biggest challenge is the loss of identity for children who have grown up in the military. As I mentioned, we had ours later in life. I mean, they just didn't know anything any different until they got out of, well, now they're in college, but they, the whole time until we retired, that's all they knew. And so many military connected, you know, they just only know that military lifestyle. And all of a sudden, they're no longer a military child. They miss being a military kid and they miss that culture. I know my daughter just loved her military ID card. And when she turned, you know, a certain age, it was gone. <laughs> she really misses it now. Um, they miss, you know, not living near or in or near that installation, going to those activities, you know, that are that were on the installation that they maybe can't be involved in anymore. They may find themselves in a new environment, even without a military presence, depending upon where that new job is located. And their new school may not have any, or maybe just a couple of military connected students. So nobody to relate to. You know, military families speak a different language. So their new friends might not understand some of their conversations like ID card and BX, PX, TDY, PCS, you know, all of those, we could go on for a long time with all of those acronyms, right? Or maybe how to tell military time. I don't know how many families use military time at home, military families, but, you know, a lot of times in this civilian world, you just don't hear that. So at the same time, they may not be fitting in with those civilian peers who don't have those similar experiences they haven't moved, they haven't changed schools, so they're trying to fit in with all these kids that have been together their whole lives, and they can't understand, you know, that your parents have been gone away for a certain amount of time, so there's deployments, and we have another really great video, and if you have lived this lifestyle, um, I think you'll find it very close to home, 
And if you have, even if you haven't, I think you'll find it a little humorous. Yeah, I heard it was yeah. not CGI. Mm -hmm. That's a oh, real story. Oh, starting? You're talking. Oh, oh my God! I thought I was on base. I thought I was on the base here. <laughs> Minnesota, so far away. What about you? Where are you from? Well, define that. I mean, like, where was I born, or where did I live the longest, or what place did I like the best? Ooh, C-141, take out. Can you see that? It's Caroline. No, Caroline. C. C is in Charlie, Alpha, Romeo, Oscar. No, my name is not Charlie. C is in Charlie. Kind of looks like a C-5, but a C-5 is like, you know. Where were you born, I guess? I was born in Guam, but I only lived there for like three months, so it doesn't really count. I mean, then I moved to Germany, so um, then I moved to Washington State, then Washington, D.C. Oh, wow, this place is almost as nice as the O Club. What's the O Club? Oh, the, um, the officer's club on base. Kind of a big deal. Texas, California, Northern California, and then Southern California two years later, but in between that I moved to Hawaii. Then we moved to Virginia. Yeah, so even with this job, I still have like seven years to like, pay off my student debt. How about you? Oh, I was actually on the GI Bill in college. Then Turkey, Okinawa in Japan, Illinois, Oklahoma. Oh my God. You were an Air Force brat also? Yeah, oh my gosh, we must have been at Ramstein at the same time. Yeah, well, I was stuck in a TLF for like three months. So by the time I turned 10, we moved to New Jersey and I was able to get my first ID card. So I love this video. It really made me laugh. They're talking about the TLF, you know, the temporary lodging facility. I know Nick and I talked about this. We have boxes that we've moved several times and you know, we just open them, look inside and close them back up and put them in storage. Um, I don't know if any of you can relate. Let us know in the chat box. Yes. I mean, it's just it's it's just the way it is. And I just think it's so cute. And um, my husband was an pilot and a helicopter pilot and I can totally relate because I could I don't know if I could do it anymore I'll be honest but I could hear a helicopter flying and tell you if it was a Chinook a Black Hawk an Apache it's just wild how you do those things so so let's talk about um, easing some of those social and emotional impacts how can we as parents help lessen some of those impacts of course, we as parents know our children the best, and we tend to know what works with our kids and maybe even what doesn't work even better. That said, here are some practical uh, suggestions. We want to prepare our kids for the cha this change. So as soon as we know like, the finality that is going to happen of the situation, just let them know it's happening. Um, help, and this helps children know what to expect, but you want to do it age appropriately. You want to share information. Um, that kind of thing can help empower the kids, let them feel like they're part of what's happening. And we want to tell them what's happening and why. You know, things like we're going to have to put some of our things aside and the movers are going to come and pack our stuff. And then those people will put it on a truck and deliver it to our new house. Those kind of things, um, especially for the little ones. Um, we want to help the children understand what's happening. Mom or dad is, you know, getting a new job and we're going to have to maybe move to a new location. Be honest and be realistic. It's okay and probably a great idea for them to know that life's going to be a little stressful for the entire family for a while. But, you know, stress can be negative or positive. So do your best to be positive. Children sense when we're stressed and we're anxious, so they pick up on all those worries. So share with them, you know, yeah, you're a bit stressed, you're a bit anxious about the new move, but show them how to deal with it. Show them how to deal with life's uncertainties and changes in a positive way. You know, take care of yourself and by having that optimistic, encouraging, positive mindset. If we acknowledge our feelings and their feelings, it, it'll help validate them. 
So as with many situations, modeling how we deal with stress as a parent is very important to how our children will react to it. Help them understand that a mixture of feelings is normal. You know, oh, I'm excited about the new move, but I'm very sad about, you know, missing our friends. And I remember our daughter was so sad to leave the one house that we were in. So, you know, it could be not, not even friends. It could be situations like that. Uh, we want to encourage conversations in the family about, well, what is causing their stress? Maybe you could do some proactive things, like maybe they're concerned about their new school. So you can go online and investigate the schools in the area. Maybe some exciting things they can do there. Sometimes even just putting a label and an emotion can help reduce the concern of a problem. We can encourage our kids, especially the little ones maybe, to draw their feelings, putting again, a name to their, their emotion. And the older kids, we can encourage them to maybe write in a journal. And remember, it's okay to say things like, I don't know all the answers. I don't have all the answers right now. It, it can be actually very freeing to our children to understand that it's actually okay not to be okay all the time. So on those notes, you want to be an active listener. Be sure to give them their, your full attention when they come to us with anything, any kind of discussion. Stop what else that you're doing if it's vacuuming or you know putting things in a box or on your phone make that eye contact and let them know that you are invested and you're in that conversation with them but be sure to reflect back maybe repeat what they're saying um, so that they get the feeling that you understand you could say something like well i think i hear that you're feeling you know sad or anxious or excited whatever it may be um, when discussing timelines, it helps to use visuals, especially the younger ones. Use a calendar to help them grasp the timeline. Cross off the days and count down to each of those new, so I say adventures, right? Movers arriving, moving to a hotel or a TLF, temporary lodging facility, or maybe the drive or a flight to the new location, all of those things on there. Um, allow them to use that social media to make connections, uh, connect to, to the groups, maybe make sure they're connected to their friends that they're leaving, but also look to connect to groups where they're going. I know our kids, we've moved, the kids have moved six or seven times, and they have friends literally all over the world that they connect with. Um, military Kids Connect is an online community for military kids six to 17 with resources, activities, online community to build understanding and resilience and coping skills. And I'm going to put the a link to that in the chat box. It's actually Military Kids Connect. And then there's another one called um, Bloom Empowering Teens. Let me put that in there. So I have a question for you again, and I appreciate all of your interactions here. Does your family have any special tradition or routine um, that you like to do before you move from an old location to a new location? So those of you, maybe not even military, but you have moved, is there something that you like to do before you move to that new location? Something that you've done uh, at that still while well, still at the old location? I know that our family, we try to visit all of our favorite restaurants. You know, it's usually not the same one. <laughs> so we may end up at four different places before we go, but it's just kind of one of those things that's comforting. Yeah, exact last dish, dinner at our favorite local restaurant. I don't know why food is easy, right? It's comforting, I think is probably why part of it anyway. Um, we wanna make sure our kids take that time and say goodbye. It really is important um, to teachers, school, um, all the support staff that they've worked with, of course, their friends, and then even places like the pool that they hang out, maybe playgrounds or, or you know, church or religious activity. It's a good idea to help them create mementos, scrapbooks with photos, maybe drawings, or ending with a photo of that new location to provide that visual transition. Um, it can be as random as collecting we talked about our, our kids collecting stones from places that they've lived or um, 
you know, from the last place before that transition. Maybe you can color the stones and find a special place for them after you transition out, like a, a little rock garden of all the places that you've been. So that's just one idea. Um, Nikki and I have a friend who um, actually creates a cross stitch of each home that she's lived in. And it's, it's incredible. But I've seen people who just have pictures or paintings or so a lot of work is put into it, with a lot of love. And those are great things to have um, as mementos. Again, we talked about those routines a little bit way back, but we really want to keep those routines as much as possible, especially with our younger children. But our older children, as well as we adults, also benefit from routines. Um, there's well-established research on the benefits of routines. They provide predictability and stability when everything else is you know, kind of chaotic in our lives. So it helps children adjust to those changes and lets them know that not everything around them is changing. And, you know, you want to explain that some important things will stay the same, you know, their toys, their books, their family, right, will still all be the same when you get to that new location. And try to give back some control to them, allow the kids to have some choice what to wear, maybe what to pack, you know, with some supervision, if they're really young, um, what they'll have for dinner. You know, and try do your best to pack up that child's room last so that they have that sanctuary while everything else is happening in the house. And then again, try to set that up first in the new location so they have that place to go while everything else is getting somewhat organized. It takes time, right? But I want to let you know that Sesame Street has created a website to support our military family. And one one specific topic is on moving into civilian life. So if you haven't already looked at some of the Sesame Street offerings for military families, they're all incredible. But this particular one is about transitioning to civilian life. And it looks like we may have lost Nikki. So we are going to just continue on um, with the well-being toolkit. So MSIC has created the Wellbeing Toolkit, which encourages participants to, um, to look through all of this. And uh, had, it has topics like self-management. You can, all of these different, there's a section for parents, there's a section for kids, and there's a section for school personnel. So it's very, very intricate, and we really encourage you to take a look at that. It is again free. I'm going to put that link in the chat box to anyone. So feel free to share this. Not only with military, but with anyone you think um, you know would benefit from this. It supports the well-being for all military connected kids, but it can help other kids as well. And we're going to look at the educational impacts of this move now too. It's one of the reasons why I asked how long it had been since you had moved, uh, retired, because um, it's, if it's within a year, it makes a big difference. Education, as we all know, is regulated by each state. So different states have different curricula, tests, schedules, and policies. And on the slide is a list of common educational impacts. So learning gaps, we're moving to another school, it's always a, a concern or maybe overlaps. So think they've already learned, they're learning again. They have different tests, they have different test schedules, they have different curriculums, some they have different grading systems. Um, kindergarten entrance age can change, graduation requirements are different. I mean, there's just so many things that can change and not only state to state, but sometimes district to district. So these are just a, you know, a few things that you have to deal with, not necessarily only when you're transitioning out of the military, but moving to a new school. So if those of you who are with the school or, or counselors probably know about the Military Interstate Children's Compact Commission or the MIC-3, um, I'm going to get a copy of this for you here in the chat box. Hmm, my computer, I am not going to get it for you in the chat box, it just froze. There we go. Um, Big three is very beneficial for our military connected children and the and the veterans up to one year after retirement. So that's why I ask about that. Um, 
the, the compact is a comprehensive approach that provides a consistent policy in every school district in every state, 50 states, and the D and District of Columbia, and is honored by DODEA. So all the schools that your kids would go to um, that aren't private schools. Additionally, this uh, also covers Gold Star families for that same coverage that one year afterwards. It is not applicable again to private schools, preschool enrollment, or whole homeschooling environments, but it addresses transition issues like kindergarten entrance age, course placement, you know, trying to get those courses to transfer to that new school and graduation requirements. So you have a, a high schooler that's transferring, gosh, that's such a difficult thing to make sure that those graduation requirements are met. So they can do their best to see that those things are transferred. And then um, we talked about having the I guess records for our kids when we go on to new schools. So we want to encourage you to check out School Quest. Now, if you want to take a look at it now while we're talking, you can, I'll give you the link here, or you can open your phone to the QR code on the screen. But this is another free uh, tool. It's an interactive tool. It was specifically designed to support those highly mobile military families and military connected kids. But honestly, anybody can use it. Uh, it's, again, it is free thanks to USAA was our funder for that. You create a virtual file for your student's academic career and you can search school options. Like if they're looking at colleges, you can find information, tools and resources that address the unique challenges of military connected students specifically. Um, some features that we'd like to tell you about is the academic tracker, the individual profile. So you have one account, but you might have, you know, all your kids on that one account, each have their own profile, has pre-built and customizable lists. So if you want to make your own list, welcome back, Nikki, <laughs> reminders and notifications. Um, it has a school search capability, so if you know where you're going, you can look up at those schools where you're attending, where you're going to be moving, and a lot of great interactive resources. So I don't know if you're if you're up for it, Nikki. I'm not sure where you are in your technology over there, but we're starting slide 21. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, you know, sometimes I do <laughs> get a phone call from the school. You've got to got to oh, take no. it when you see it. So, <laughs> no um, problem. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about that student portfolio. Um, this is one of the top recommendations, not for just transitions, but just kind of in general. Yeah, we talked about how we have our portfolios. Michelle's is easily accessible. Um, but it's a great place to have records for those applications, those scholarships, those future schools. Um, high schoolers can use it for college fairs and writing that resume. And it's just kind of somewhere that you can kind of keep everything together. Think about work samples. So if your student has um, maybe a great essay they've written or an art, you know, something if they're artistic, um, you can keep that in there. And then that personal information and other documents to reflect your students' activities throughout the year. Those are really important as well. So we suggest a two to three inch binder, but with tab dividers. But honestly, I use like little color coded folders. Actually, I'll show you one that I have right here that I put labels on. Um, and then I put it inside of um, like a little accordion case that I kind of hand carry. So whatever works for you, I think just kind of utilize the be what works for you the best. Just again, remember, put all of those kind of important pieces of documents, um, report cards, transcripts, um, IEPs, if you have a student that has specialized services or a 504 plan. Um, make sure that you include those extracurricular activities and those volunteer hours. Um, something that I think is great, especially if you have older children, involving them in that process of kind of pulling everything together, I think is great. Um, we talked about, Michelle talked about SchoolQuest is a great way to kind of put that virtual portfolio. 
And also think about videos capturing um, for sports or for exceptional needs, um, students that are working with a specific teacher or an aide, maybe photos, if that's something that you're able to do. Um, I think that's really important as well. So easing those educational impacts for our exceptional learners is really important. Um, for, the, um, for the family with an exceptional learner, support systems and services often restart every time that you move. If your family is using services that have maybe been on that military installation, now you're going to a lot of times need to transition to those civilian services. The worst word a parent with a child with exceptional needs can hear is wait list. So some caregivers um, have reported great stress and weariness from trying to get all their services in place over and over again with multiple military moves. If you have the IEP or the 504 reviewed um, and if needed updated before you relocate so that you kind of have that new plan um, that might carry a little bit more weight after you transition. Make sure that you ask teachers and staff to provide services to your student to write letters, outlining those service accommodations, maybe copy of records, um, include their experience and suggestions, um, what doesn't work, what works, um, and help provide that to the new school so that maybe they can provide those comparable services. And then any recommendations from professionals can provide a much appreciated um, information to that new school district, kind of connect them together. So I think that works. Um, and then we'll talk about easing educational impacts for the current school. So um, make sure that you meet with school staff so that you can come up with that plan. Every state's going to require different testing, entrance and exit testing. Um, find out if the school you're leaving requires an exit test. If the school does, meet with those new teachers and counselors um, as soon as possible. Ask if the student can take tests prior to moving. A lot of times they'll be able to do that if you're needing to move earlier, like before the end of the school year. Uh, make sure that you're requesting copies of the student's record so that you can have those. A lot of times they'll give you an unofficial transcript. Um, and if you know what school your student's going to be attending, go ahead and reach out, um, talk about those transferring credits, Find out who your POC is, which is usually, I feel like the registrar or the records clerk is someone um, that you'd want to talk to and know all of those kind of names and phone numbers so that you have that um, as well. And then easing those educational impacts for that new school, meeting with those staff, uh, make sure that you introduce yourself and you ask questions and that you discuss the concerns Make sure you're involving the child in that transition process so that you can build confidence um, and give the child some control in the situation. Watch for those learning gaps um, and maybe even overlaps. We talk about that a lot um, so that you can you know, speak with the staff in regards to that or the teachers. And please reach out for support. Um, if you need assistance and your student is struggling, please reach out to the teacher and or counselor. Um, they can be so helpful, especially at that new school. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Michelle and she's gonna talk about after transition. All righty, thank you. Let me get, um, let me get ready. <laughs> Here I am, all right. So when you, after your transition and you get to that new location, you want to really make sure that you enjoy that new location. So explore the new surroundings, pick walks, find you know, new activities to do. Maybe there's things that you didn't have available where you were before. Make those connections in your new community. Seek out veteran families. You never know. There might be organizations in the area, even though you might not have any neighbors or anything, but try to seek out those veteran families. So get to know those new neighbors. Um, you could look for mom and parent groups, like PTA groups, volunteer for any kids activity that your child is in, you know, your band booster was my kids were in band, so I did that. Um, I will say for the younger kids, especially the library story time is a fantastic place to meet new families and it, it gives you an out. 
and it's educational. <laughs> so be, like I said, be involved if possible, volunteering, start burning on those field trips. That's not for the faint of heart, but it's really great <laughs> as far as getting to know people and getting to know those kids that you're that your kids might be friends with. So that was always a really benefit, beneficial part of chaperoning. Um, during the PTA, PTO, that's always very easy. So sign those kids up for clubs, get them in activities to connect with their peers. If they were in activities before, actually one of the things that um, our kids, especially our last transition they were in, our daughter was in high school, she actually uh, contacted the school she was in band. She auditioned with a, a video, contacted the on, on the school she was going to and was able to get in band as soon as she arrived. So keeping them in those activities that they enjoy is key. Stick to those routines as best as possible. Um, I know that we, during COVID, we, we kind of went away from it now because people are back in college, but they were both home right after COVID and we had family of uh, Friday fire pit nights and it really turned out to be fun. I really look forward to it. So try to find, stick to some kind of routine uh, that your family likes, maybe Friday game night. And if you notice again, your child is having times with a hard time with transition, it, whether it be academic or whether it be more of a, of a psychological issue, make sure that you reach out for the support. Let's talk about some of the many resources that are available to our veterans and their families when they leave, and there are a lot. VA Veteran Centers. So vet centers are community-based and part of the Department of Veteran Affairs. So they provide, provide a wide range of social and psychological services, including professional readjustment counseling to eligible veterans active duty service members, including National Guard and reserve components and their families. They offer readjustment counseling. It's offered to help smooth that transition from active duty to civilian life, or maybe after a traumatic event that was experienced in the military. They have individual, group, marriage, and family counseling offered to our VA um, community. So um, there, let's see put that in the chat box, the link for that in the chat box. And then we have USO Pathfinder. The USO Pathfinder Transition Program is designed to provide personalized support for transitioning service members and their spouses. So with locations all across the country, they offer a variety of workshops and one-on-one -on -one career guidance. And we talked about sometimes that moving into a civilian career can really be a challenge. <laughs> the expectations, you know, what, what's expected of me. The next one is the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. For, this is for military caregivers. So this is empowering, it's supporting, and it honors our nation's 5.5 million military caregivers, spouses, parents, family members, you know, often children, and friends who care for America's wounded, ill, or injured veterans. Then we have Oh, oh, then we have the youth caregivers are also known as hidden helpers. These are the, like I said, not out of all of those, the children sometimes end up being a big part of caregiving. Children, youth, and young adults up to 18 who are actively involved or currently uh, impacted by the care of a wounded or injured veteran. There are approximately 2.3 million children under the age of 18 that live with a disabled veteran in our communities across the United States. So the Hidden Helpers is a great place for those people, those children to reach out, those families. The Military and Family Life Counseling Program or MILFLEX the Military and Family Life Counseling Program supports our service members, their families, and survivors with non-medical counseling worldwide. They're trained to work with the military community. They deliver that face-to-face -face counseling, um, and they do briefings and presentations to the military community both on and off the installation. But that's a really great benefit. Military One Source is vetted by the Department of Defense. A military one source connects service members, spouses, and family members to programs, services, and products developed to help navigate 
military life and this transition. Military One Source has also detailed information regarding that transition from military to civilian life. So do not hesitate to reach out for support. And then we, oh, let me, one more thing. I forgot the military student consultant and the military student consultants are an MSEC provided regional one-on-one -on -one support for advocacy and problem solving and to assist military connected families and professionals. And we'll talk a little bit about them a little bit later as well, but they're also a free resource. And Nikki, I'll go ahead and do the final thoughts. So we're going to, we talked about, well, let's see, let's talk about Dr. Ginsburg. We love Dr. Ginsburg. We have personally met him. I, I think I met him four times now. And uh, Kate, he's just really a, a nice guy, neat guy. He says, some things are simply beyond our control for grownups and children alike. And the only thing we can really control is how we choose to react. Often the best thing we can do in these situations is to conserve our energy and move ahead without tearing ourselves apart. So great words to live by. And we talked about uh, social, emotional, and educational impact. Yes, Stacy knows Dr. Ginsburg too. <laughs> Just such a nice man. Uh, about the impact of the transitions, how to maybe prepare your family if you're in the process of that transition, and some great resources that we've shared with you. So now, as we told you in the beginning, we really encourage, invite you, and encourage you to take our survey for today's webinar. And you can do that by clicking on the survey that will, um, uh, on the link that will be in the chat box in a minute. But you can also, like the school quest, you can use your phone and open up and use the QR code, which will just open up right to directly to the survey. You will have to enter a four digit webinar code to let the survey know what specific webinar you attended. And today's webinar code is 5223. And just know that if you, oh, and don't forget to hit uh, and submit at the end of the survey so that it does go. But just know that if you don't fill it out now following this webinar, you will receive an email with an invitation to take it. So we do appreciate if you would take that. This provides great feedback to our funders. So before we leave, we also want to share some of those great resources, some of them that we've already talked about. One is our recordings. If you've missed one of our previous webinars, or maybe you want to be with this one again, or want to share this session, the recordings can be found on our website, militarychild.org. Under Programs, Trainings, and Initiatives, click on the Four Parents and then in the middle of the screen, you'll see all the webinars that we have to offer. And that link to that library is in the chat box. We'd also like to invite you to take part in many of our online professional development institute opportunities. And that link is in the chat box. And we also would like you to check out and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and LinkedIn. Find out what we're doing. Um, we talked about School Quest, that online interactive tool. You're able to make that virtual portfolio on there free. Really, anyone can use it. So check it out and feel free to share that resource. Here's the military student consultants we just mentioned. They are the premier source to help you with all of your questions, educated related questions for your military connected children. The well-being toolkit that we talked about, um, it is developed for parents, school professionals, behavioral mental health professionals, and community leaders. So it really is developed for a range of people to use. Um, it's full of resources. So go ahead and check that out. And again, feel free to share that. We're very excited that this summer is the Global Training Summit from July 24th to the 26th. This will be our 25th anniversary. So I'm sure that will be, make it just a little bit more exciting. And registration is open and um, that link is, will be in the chat box. If you're interested in getting a certificate of completion for today, um, please complete that online survey. If you would like a webinar, a survey for a recorded webinar so that you can get that certificate of completion, you can contact 
uh, research at militarychild.org. And that link is in the chat box. And we have some great webinars. Nikki and I will be back on Tuesday the 16th to present helping your military kid overcome procrastination today, <laughs> Tuesday. Uh, we will talk about that. And then on Wednesday the 17th, college transitions for military connected homeschool students. So something that uh, is very common within the military homeschooling. So that should be a really interesting webinar. And just remember that all of our webinars start at 12 noon. The links for registration for those are in the chat box. And we want to give a special thanks again to the Department of Air Force School Liaison Program for making today's webinar possible. We want to thank you for taking your time attending and interacting with us today on the workshop.